Hi, I'm Kate McKay, Associate Film Curator here at the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. I'm delighted to welcome you to BAMPFA's Watch From Home live stream conversation and Q&A for Don Porter's powerful documentary, John Lewis, Good Trouble. I just watched it again today and it's a remarkable achievement, a rich, nuanced and timeless portrait of a powerful leader and the amazing circle of friends, family and colleagues that surround him. It's a serious subject, but full of wonderful humor. So if you haven't seen it yet, you can stream the documentary via bampfa.org, where you can also find our full lineup of Watch From Home offerings. Thank you to the team at Magnolia Pictures for including BAMPFA in the nationwide release of the documentary. And thank you very much to Otis R. Taylor Jr. for agreeing to speak with Don Porter today. And last but not least, thank you to everyone who's tuning in. We miss seeing you at the Barbara Osher Theater, but we're really happy that you found us here. And I'd just like to introduce our speakers today. Otis R. Taylor Jr. is the East Bay columnist for the San Francisco Chronicle, focusing on race, housing, pol policing, and immigration. A South Carolina transplant, Taylor spent more than a decade at the State University in Columbia, South Carolina, writing about arts, culture, and entertainment. And previously, he was the managing editor of a tech startup. Taylor is interested in reporting on issues relating to diversity and equality in the East Bay, as well as the region's history, culture, and politics. And Don Porter is an award-winning documentary filmmaker whose work has screened nationally and globally on HBO, PBS, Discovery, and Netflix. Her current projects include Vernon Johnson, Make It Plain, a documentary about one of the most influential African-American thinkers in America, and a documentary about photojournalist Pete Souza, who served as official White House photographer for Presidents Barack Obama and Ronald Reagan. Her other works include the critically acclaimed series, Bobby Kennedy for President, and documentaries Trapped and Spies of Mississippi, a historical documentary that tells the story of how state spies tried to block voting rights for African-Americans during the civil rights era. Dawn is a member of the Academy of the Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, the Television Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the Directors Guild of America, and during the 2018-2019 academic year, Porter led the documentary program at UC Berkeley's Graduate School of Journalism. So we're delighted to welcome Don back to BAM PFA, if, even, if it's just virtually. And today's format, we'll have a conversation of about 30 minutes and there'll, there'll be time for a Q&A from the audience afterwards. Please feel free to submit your questions anytime uh, via the chat in YouTube and uh, we'll, we'll take a look at your questions in about 30 minutes. So I will turn it over to Otis and Don now. Thanks very much for joining us today. Hey, thank you for having us, uh, BAM PFA. Uh, Don, welcome. How are you doing? You. I'm doing really well. Thank you so much for doing this. I gotta say, you know, you're doing, this, this almost like a biography of this uh, civil rights activist uh, turned legislator, his life. Um, in, a, in, a, in a very real way, you're allowing John Lewis to get his flowers while he's still with us. But Don, I gotta say, the current climate that we're in with this country, where we're dealing with uh, this racial reckoning with uh, people, again, marching in the streets, just like John Lewis did all those years ago. Tell me, what, what, is, what was it like putting this film together, knowing it's going to be released on July 3rd, and then seeing what's happening today? Yeah, you know, um, our, so I followed the congressman uh, for about a year and it was right before the 2018 midterm. So a really important, um, you know, time for him as an advocate for other representatives, desperately trying to take back the House of Representatives um, and, you know, push back against this, uh, this awful administration. Um, and, and so we, when CNN came to me, CNN came to me and said they wanted to, you know, they were interested 
in having a film about the congressman. And, and I thought to myself, you know, what, I really thought there's, there's a lot to be said about John Lewis, but what, what did I want to say at this time? Mm -hmm. Of course, none of us could have imagined that this time would be this time. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, initially I was thinking, I want to remind people of the importance of protest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> um, so, you know, we were scheduled to premiere at Tribeca Film Festival um, and our premiere date was April 21st. So um, we were still thinking maybe there was going to be some form of Tribeca, um, you know, and, and it was so disappointing when Tribeca was canceled. But now, you know, I, I literally think there's nothing more American than John Lewis's story. Mm. Um, and I think uh, a lot of us, um, we would like our flag back <laughs> and we would like to, to, you know, for America to live up of, to its promise. So, um, you know, the film has uh, even more relevance and importance for me now. Um, also at the time that we finished it, we finished it back in December. Mm -hmm. um, he had not yet been diagnosed with, with pancreatic cancer. So, so much has changed, you know, um, between the time that we finished the movie and, and released it. Um, I, I, art is often a way that we work through difficult problems. And so I am thinking that this will be one of the many conversation starters. Um, but I also think it's serving a different purpose which is it's peaceful and you can watch it with your family and you can think of a great American and think of what he has contributed. Um, and as you say, give him his roses, you know, and I was lucky enough to, I, I flew to DC um, from San Francisco and, and uh, I sat with him and showed him the movie, which is always stressful <laughs> when you show somebody something. Um, and so we watched it together oh, and uh, he kept saying, so powerful, so powerful. You know, and when it was, I said, Mr. Lewis, your life is powerful. Um, and then we, we just, it was, a, you know, it was an evening, early afternoon. And we just had, we just spent another couple of hours just talking about everything and nothing. And, um, you know, so I'll always have that time with him. And I know, I know that he saw all of this, you mm -hmm. know, and mm -hmm. that, that is to exactly what you're saying. He saw it while he's here and was able to appreciate what we as people see in him. You don't always see yourself the way others see you. So I know that this is one way of helping him see himself as we see him. You know, there was a point in, in the film where um, <clears throat> I believe it was an aide, you captured it, where he's telling a story that, you know, if, do I remember a March on Washington or something like that? And he said, <laughs> I spoke at the March on Washington in 1963. Yeah. Does the congressman recognize what you as a filmmaker saw in him, the importance, the, the power of his life and his work? Does he recognize that or is he just so driven by the conviction instilled to him as a boy to make this country better? I think he really um, didn't think of, uh, he understands that he can motivate people. He understands that he is beloved. He doesn't know that. Mm -hmm. But I do think there was a moment for him when it kind of all came together. And I think you know, you'll see um, in the film, one of the things is John Lewis has lived a public life for 60 years. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he tells his story repeatedly. Um, one is because it's all the questions that everybody wants to know the answers to, but also there is an oral tradition in the black community. And that's how you preserve your history by you repeat and you tell your story until others can repeat it and share it forward. So I, I actually do think that that's part of why he, you know, impresses upon people some things that are really important to him. Um, but I, you know, as a filmmaker, I wanted to get more. I wanted to understand some more context. So um, we had followed him to Selma. He does a yearly pilgrimage where he retraces his steps um, across the Selma Bridge. 
Mm -hmm. um, and uh, while we were, and that's the trip, and we were, that's Keith uh, to the left there, uh, Keith Walker, who's the cinematographer I work with quite a bit. Um, and that was, you know, all of us walking across that bridge and retracing his steps, a very, very powerful thing to do. Um, but uh, while we were on that trip, the congressman, we were touring uh, Brian Stevenson's beautiful civil rights museum mm -hmm. and with the congressman. And he's watching an exhibit that is about him <laughs> at the museum. <laughs> so can you imagine being at the museum with John Lewis, tell, you know, watching himself? And mm -hmm. while he was watching it, he said, I can't believe that's me. I can't believe that's me. And so it gave me the idea to construct a longer, you know, film of just archive. And then we sat him, I rented a stage, a theater, and we sat him in front of uh, this archival kind of, this is your life, like you see on the screen there. And then I just said, tell me the story. You know, I put a whole crew around him. And, uh, you know, during, I think to your point, I think seeing the archive that way mm -hmm. and seeing the sequence of all the remarkable things, I mean, you know, protesting, um, organizing Nashville at 19, mm -hmm. you know, walking across that bridge in his 20s, um, you know, just, I, I think, so he, at a, there's a point in the film where he says, I'm seeing things I never saw before. And I think he's not only talking about one image, mm -hmm. I think he's talking about all of it. I think he's talking about how, you know, it was all there laid in front of him uh, to see and to, so, um, so I think he, at least for that moment, I know he saw himself as we see him, but he's a very, um, he's just not about the glory. Mm, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like he just is what needs to be done. He's a helper, you know, like he's like those black church ladies, you know, who are like, um, they never met a committee they didn't want to join. Yeah. You know, like that's John Lewis. Like he off my grandmother. <laughs> right, right. Like it's like, oh, okay, I'll organize that, you know. Um, uh, and that's the tradition he comes from, and that's how he lives. So he keeps he keeps helping. I um there's so much to talk about here, but uh we just saw those images. What was that like for you as a black woman, a filmmaker? who is existing in a time where the current presidential administration is being rather oppressive to people of color. What was it like for you to go do that research and go back through the archives to, to help build your narrative for, for John Lewis's life? You know, it was uh, very healing, actually. It was, I felt part of something and I felt uh, strengthened and supported. Mm -hmm. um, and then being with Mr. Lewis for that year, you know, I would <laughs> periodically say to him, oh, Mr. Lewis, this happened today, you know, kids in cages or that happened or, and he would say, you know, yes, it's terrible. And then he would kind of guide the conversation to what was happening to counter that mm -hmm. and, and encourage me to think about what I was doing to stop that and then saying that's why we have to vote and that's why you have to organize and that's why and you know over that year like my my husband started calling him my life coach <laughs> <laughs> because, <I> mean, <laughs> you know he is saying don't let somebody else dictate your game you know mm -hmm. you are are in charge of your life and when we think about how far we've come you know there people say oh nothing's changed of course things have changed you know, this year we showed the record breaking 55 members of the Black Caucus. Mm -hmm. When George Floyd was brutally murdered before our eyes, there were protests in not all, only all 50 United States, but around the world. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, jammed, packed in Europe, in, you know, all over the, all over the place. So uh, I think John Lewis doesn't get depressed the same way a lot of us because he takes such a long view of history and because what he's focused on what he can do, mm -hmm. not what somebody's trying to stop. 
you know, because he just never stopped. Mm. I mean, imagine the audacity of believing, growing up as a sharecropper's kid with, in very poor circumstances and believing that you could integrate the, the ironclad South. Mm -hmm. Like what imagination and intelligence does it take to see that world when nothing, he couldn't even get a library card mm -hmm. in his hometown. And so, you know, he had no problem seeing the future that we want to be and then working to bring it into existence. And, and that's what he, he reminds us that we all have the power to do. Nobody can control your imagination and your creativity. Mm -hmm. He was instrumental in uh, pushing for um, the Voting Rights Act in 1965. And again, and I believe it was 2006 with um, George W. Bush as president. That was what Bush, you know, that is one of his defining achievements in his presidency was, again, uh, putting forth legislation that would not allow people to racially discriminate at the polls. But it's here we stunning, are. isn't it? <laughs> yes, exactly. That's 2006. But here we are 14 years later. And again, we're seeing voter suppression um, techniques in the South, like closing um, polling places just so, you know, your black and brown population will have to wait longer in line, won't have the same access to the polling. How did, in your conversations with Congressman Lewis, how was he responding to that, what he's seeing around in the South that he fought to desegregate, that he fought to get voting rights to? How, how did, is he responding to that? You know, um, he, uh, you know, first of all, was sounding the alarm for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think that is part of why he was campaigning so hard for, you know, when he's out there for Lizzie Fletcher in- I Houston, know, down ballot. <laughs> he's a big race, <laughs> yeah. you know. But for him, he was really thinking, where can I make a difference? Mm -hmm. And you see, I mean, all of that campaigning, that was one morning that we followed him. And he went to five black churches and campaigned for Colin Alred and Beto O'Rourke and Lizzie Fletcher. That was just his Texas swing. You know, we couldn't actually keep up with him. He went to down to Florida, you know, working for Andrew Gillum. So, um, you know, I, I think part of it is shining a light. He was like, I've seen this story before. Yes. You know, this is, this is a different method of the same, with the same goal. I've seen this story. Um, and then, you know, HR1 is the first bill that was introduced in the 2019 Congress. And that was to restore the Voting Rights Act. So, I mean, think of, you know, John Lewis is a 20 something. He has a pen from President Lyndon Johnson that was the signing of the original Voting Rights Act. And mm -hmm. he still has this pen. Um, but I, I've seen it, it's beautiful, you know, it holds a place of honor in his home. And then, you know, in 2019, he had to reintroduce legislation to reauthorize those provisions that he had fought so hard to see enacted in the mid 1960s. So he, he really, um, I don't know, he's just, he just, just does not give up. <laughs> this is not a man who knows the meaning of the word no. I mean, he really is, he's just gonna find another way. Mm -hmm. So that was that was also really motivating and inspirational for me. I was like, if John Lewis is not giving up, then I have no standing to, to lie in bed with the covers over my head. <laughs> well, that's, I'm glad you say that because um, what I got from the film was um, a renewed energy. Because I have to admit, you know, writing about race at this time, it is kind of draining because of the stories that we're hearing, especially in the last two weeks, we're getting the backlash uh, against this racial movement that we're having in this, in this country. As a matter of fact, in Martinez, uh, two white people went out and defaced the Black Lives Matter street mural that was painted on July 4th. Within an hour, they were out there. Well, those two people were charged with a hate crime today. That is something that's different. 
Yeah. But what I want to discuss is how this language that the protesters are thugs, yeah. they're terrorists, you know, they're trying to, you know, upend our way of life. They are trying, they are the our. problem. Who's our? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. What can viewers learn from John Lewis about that nonviolent approach about just walking in the streets and being seen, and then when the violence comes towards you, turning the cheek and continuing on your way? Yeah, you know, um, it, one of the, there's so much in your, in your question. Um, you know, one thing I wanna start with though is part of the reason I showed John Lewis at home and showed what a sanctuary he has created for himself. He loves art, he loves music. He's a very quiet person. Mm -hmm. He spends the mornings reading every page of the local paper and then the national paper. He reads multiple papers a day. Um, is because your life has to have balance. And so uh, mm -hmm. your work requires you to be exacting about the details of the violence against black and brown bodies. And that is a particular kind of trauma for you. In order to get it right, you have to continuously re-experience this violence. And that, so I know because he has encouraged me because in film, I have to watch things over and yes. over. The images, and, you're um, seeing it. You're like, seeing it and you're writing it and you're fact checking it. So you're repeating it over and over and over. And if that is the, 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 the picture in your head, um, that's overwhelming for people. So, you know, I, I think the Congressman also makes a point of having a peaceful, positive focus. He likes to antique, <laughs> he likes his chickens. Um, and, you know, I, I certainly, he loves the chickens. <laughs> and certainly during this pandemic, you know, particularly after George Floyd's brutal murder, um, you know, I had to tell a number of white friends, do not call my two teenage boys and ask how they are. Um, that is re-traumatizing, you know? Um, people wanted, you know, and I understand the impulse and I appreciate it, but y'all need to talk to each other <laughs> because I am not perpetrating racist violence against people who don't look like me. So, so that, that's one thing. Um, is I think self-care is a big part of his life. He's not always the fierce, you know, kind of warrior. Um, but uh, so for me being with him while we were, you know, in this moment, um, I felt like it was really important to show not only his bravery, which he's known for, but also the strategy of those young people, you know? It is no accident. So we have in the film, the training that they undertook with Reverend oh, Lawson. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if you understand anything about John Lewis, you understand that he studied Gandhi, he studied philosophy, he studied philosophers. Part of his religion is a feeling of nonviolence. And, and it is the feeling of power in that. He owns power over his own body, his own spirit enough so that he's not gonna allow an angry, hateful person to change him. Mm -hmm. He's gonna, re retaining his peace is his active form of, you know, uh, resistance. So um, once you understand that, you know, there's a, a line his uh, friend and colleague, uh, Reverend Bernard Lafayette says um, about the attackers. He's like, we kept giving them the opportunity to change. Mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of how I feel about this moment is, um, you know, we who are joining hands with people of all races and backgrounds and genders, we are giving those who are choosing another way the opportunity to change and learn if they will see. Um, but that doesn't mean it's our responsibility. So I will welcome you if you want to join me, but I'm not going to do your work. Wow, that's, that is <laughs> such, that is so interesting, Dawn, because I've been having conversations, um, you know, since George Floyd was killed about what responsibility, if any, that I have to educate white people who are unwilling to meet me, you know, halfway or even, you know, to come over and be educated. And that's interesting you say that. That's it's Well, I think if anyone's doing the work, you are. 
So, you know, what I say to people is you can Google, <laughs> you <Yeah>. know, um, <laughs> you can read a book, find something that you find interesting. I'm happy maybe to talk about it with you, yeah. but, um, uh, you know, I do feel, and I, and I actually do think it's very, very important that the protests we're seeing are multiracial. Yes, they are. Um, and people are realizing, mm -hmm. you know, we weren't making it up. We weren't mm -hmm. overly sensitive. <laughs> so, um, you know, so I do see hope in that, in that, in that development. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think what I'm looking for now is you know, when you look at Mr. Lewis and what he did, but what they planned, you know, mm -hmm. there's archive in the film where the narrator explains that as each of the young civil rights workers was arrested, they were given a choice. Yes. Jail mm -hmm. or jail. And they, and he says they all chose jail. Mm -hmm. That was no small thing. I mean, there, John Lewis was jailed in Parchman prison for 40 days where they did not feed them. They took their clothes. They had them sleep on the floor. This was not, you know, slap on the wrist. You go home after you pray with John Jane Fonda on the steps. I mean, this was real jail in deep South, kill black people, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, those young people were prepared and they knew what they were doing, and they knew that that was the way to call attention. But you know, it also led to some significant change. I mean, it is awesome that the Voting Rights Act gets signed just, you know, five years into his activism. I mean, that is awesome. Yeah, it's, it, I, that's, that's powerful. Uh, that guy, uh, man, I can't believe you got him dancing. <laughs> like that's just, <laughs> it's just like, it, you know, I, from my, just what I have knowledge of him is just a studious uh, person who is, just committed and he's always on message. And then I get to see him like cutting a rug. Just like, how did you get that? He loves that dance. He, he loves has, music. How, like he, he was letting you music. have ever all that access, Don. He loves Pharrell, like is his favorite. Um, it was uh, very funny. We had to call Pharrell and see if he would let us use the song. And he's like, yeah, it's my man, John. <laughs> Um, so, um, you know, um, we, uh, were fortunate to have, um, his staff was very helpful in that. So they had taken a lot of videos over the years, um, particularly his staff member, Rachelle O'Neill. Mm -hmm. Um, and she became, you know, like we're good friends now. And, and I think she could see how important Mr. Lewis's life was to me. And once she, you know, realized that she really kind of let us in, you know, she was the one who said, make sure you see his art, you know, in his home. And when he gave us a tour of his, you know, his original Jacob Lawrence and Charles and Romir Bearden. <laughs> and I said, Mr. Lewis, is this insured? You know, like, <laughs> like and he's like, well, you know, they were my friends. They were, and, and he loved showing, you know, his collection. Um, so we just had a good time. <laughs> I, that's, that's great. With everything, you know, I was like, you want to go to Troy? And he's like, okay, you know, like you want to go, can I come to your house at eight in the morning and stay all day? But it's also, um, I, you, you know, when you're a documentary person, you have to pick your crew wisely. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I try and use the same camera people. And so your subjects get a relationship with your, camera people mm -hmm. you know, he really liked you know his tony two african-american gentlemen he really liked them he was he would sometimes speak to them as much as he was speaking to me so i think he was just very comfortable i think he really had a good time that's, making... that's good and then and then uh, i know you know the documentary I, I forget how long it is but i know you have hours upon hours of film and how I know that is because anytime you went somewhere with him, I mean, he's got the whole crowd. I mean, everybody wants to talk. And he stopped going through the airport. <laughs> this man will stop for everyone and just have a conversation. He did that so many times that that's <laughs> right. So that sequence in the movie is like a mashup of multiple, multiple times because we would laugh about it. Like, <laughs> You know, my editors would be like, oh, here's another hour of people coming up, you know, so 
we had like a whole time of editing just the best of those because there were so many um you know and i would say like oh do you have you know and she's like yep i have everybody you could possibly want <laughs> oh, nice well yeah. you know one thing also don that this it sounded different this 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 film so i wanted you to talk about um the sound techniques that you um that you implemented so it could this it almost made the documentary pop more if you know what i mean no i do that you know so the the sound design and the music were so so important so i collaborated with a, a composer his name is tamar kali and her first uh, feature film score, she's fairly new to film scoring, but her first feature score was Mudbound. Oh, wow. And I just loved what she did in that movie. Um, and my producer, Laura Michael Chisson, found her and said, this is the woman who needs to score this film. And so I asked her to write a modern spiritual because you know part of what I wanted to do in the movie is connect John Lewis from his past to his present because everything he's doing today has its grounding in his history and in you know in the land i mean he is so fortunate to you know there's a reason why he tells the story um that his parents were able to buy land that's not a common story for a lot of black people from the south mm -hmm. that a they were able to buy land and b to be able to keep it so you know i know that that's really important to the congressman and and i think that that was kind of fundamental to what he was able to achieve. He could always go home. Mm -hmm. he, he knew what home was. Mm -hmm. He still knows what it is. So, you know, like you and I were talking about the need to restore yourself. He had a very firm understanding of who he, he was and where he came from, who his people were. So I think that that was, that was very important. But Tamar Kali, you know, once I said modern spiritual, she just kind of ran with that. And, uh, you know, she used a full orchestra <laughs> and she sings on, you know, in the movie, there's some, some of the vo vocals are hers. Wow. She handpicked other musicians. At one point um, in the sequence where we took him back to Troy and, and I was talking to her about the importance of the land and the importance of land to black people and farming and connection to, the, to this earth and to this place. And she's like, oh, you need a field holler. And I was like, Oh, I need a field holler. Yes. I don't know what a field holler is, right? Yeah. And uh, she is from South Carolina. She's a Gullah Geechee woman. Oh, really? And so she, you know, kind of called on that tradition and found their their uh, folk songs. Like, and so they were, you know, free. She re-recorded some field holler songs. She has her favorite field hollers. <laughs> but like I, all of that, you layer that into the work so it's it's the visuals the way they're filmed you know all mostly handheld um and then her beautiful score which just propels you along in the movie with a little stevie wonder in the middle so you know <laughs> I, I, it's south carolina uh yeah uh, represent uh so i want to go back to the edmund pettus bridge and um, this is a bridge where uh, I believe it's in 1965, where they're trying to walk from Selma to Montgomery. And it was Alabama State Troopers, um, just the, this line of white men who didn't want them to cross. And so instead of saying, hey, turn around or give uh, a warning, they beat the people marching peacefully. Like there's, there's no... Um, and just in front of people, like it, it, people were there to watch that brutal beating. Yeah. This is a bridge that President Obama visited. Yeah. Walked across with John Lewis. What was it like for you, Don, um, after your filmmaking career to just to experience that with John Lewis, but also for yourself to go to such a place in history? Yeah. You know, um, it, it, um, it is as moving as you would think because you feel that you are walking in the steps of your ancestors that um you know you you start to see you start to hear what happened there um the bridge is so much smaller than i thought you mm -hmm. know you kind of like see it as this long um and so it felt like 
I felt like being transported back to the Revolutionary War. You know, I felt like the immediacy of what he must have confronted. Um, and, you know, and then, you know, a, so a large group of us, several hundred people walked across the bridge with him. And then he stopped and addressed the crowd. And you could literally hear a pin drop. I mean, everyone was, people were crying. Um, you know, place is important, you know, and understanding like how we have built our common history is important, but also, you know, we all knew that it ended well, mm -hmm. that as much violence as there was against him and the other workers that they not only survived, but he was there as our leader. He was there as a sitting United States Congressman Mm -hmm. leading a con congressional delegation. And that's, you know, that felt like progress, you know, that felt like something wonderful has happened here. And, and so his, you know, telling of retelling of that story and retracing his steps. It's also, you know, it's so generous of him because that was a really, he thought he was going to die, you know, and he goes back there every year and reminds himself of what he experienced, but he also reminds us. Yes. So, you know, now we have this, this the movie and, uh, you know, everyone is able to share that experience and to celebrate that victory of those very young people. You know, you see his um, partner on the bridge who's holding his nose because they knew that they were gonna be tear gassed. They knew it and they walked into danger. I mean, most of us are about self-preservation. We walk away from pain. We walk away from danger. That's why we're all home. Yeah. Um, yeah. John Lewis, you know, walked towards that, and he did that for all of us. So, I have to say, Don, I grew up in South Carolina, um, where the Confederate flag flew on top of the State House dome, and then they moved it to the grounds. It wasn't removed until Dylan Roof went into a church in Charleston and killed nine black people. But I have to say that uh, in 2018, I went on a, for vacation, I went on a, a civil rights tour of Alabama, you know, just- You need to branch out. I'm gonna send you to Jamaica, okay? <laughs> <laughs> like Bermuda. Well, I wanted to go- Sweden, like go to Sweden. <laughs> well, I was going to be like, as right now, uh, right when we're talking, I was going to be, in Germany. Um, That's what I'm talking about. You were probably going to like re remembrance museums though. Yeah, hey, well, of course. I mean, that's my friend and I who travel, that's what we do. We like to, you know, we want to educate ourselves in history. And I mean, in 2018, we went to um, uh, Brian Stevenson's museum. We went to the Memorial. Um, we went to the bridge uh, and then we went to um, the 16th Street Baptist Church and that yeah. just, that <sighs> floored me that just floored me because um i just didn't understand how someone could be so hateful yeah. about social children. progress that they would kill children yeah. and then i i watch uh this film on john lewis where this is a guy that's seen much more than i'll ever experience and he's still positive Maybe. and he's still you know committed um, that has to rub off on everyone around him, including you and your and your film crew. It it it, it did. It, it it really it does. Um, I think also John Lewis is the most peaceful person I've ever met. He is not angry. He is not prideful. Um, he is funny. He's like really at peace with himself. Really at peace. Um, you know, he, he does have bad days, of course, but he's for the most part, um, he kind of just like doesn't sweat the small stuff, you know, and as much pain and anger and hate as he's seen, he's also seen remarkable progress. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, he's like, it's where you choose to rest your eyes. <laughs> so he chooses to rest his eyes towards the light. Um, and I think because of that, he has lived a very full life, you know? And, and I think that he, I, I think also coming from, you know, a really 
impoverished background, he doesn't take anything for granted. Um, he really relishes birds. <laughs> he loves cats. You know, he's he's like your grandfather. He loves his those little cats. <laughs> so uh, at this point, I would like to invite our uh, viewers who are watching at home. I wish we could be together. I, I mean, you know, this, you know, I have to remind myself daily that, you know, I have to do my part and, and trying to stem the tide of this pandemic. But I would like to invite our viewers, if you have any questions, please go ahead and um, file them in the chat and I'll, I'll get to them. Um, because I want to hear from others too. I mean, I'm having fun talking to you, but I do want to hear from others too. So Don, this, another thing that got me was the sit-ins and just knowing someone was there at, you know, this point where there was just so much tension around desegregation. But man, just having food tossed on people, having, you know, uh, milkshakes poured on people's heads and having people yell at them. And I thought it was really important that you included imagery of white people standing and sitting beside um, beside him. Talk about that, um, acknowledging that, you know, that there were allies. Um, there's many more now <laughs> than then, but just the allyship that was still present. Um, and, and, and what John Lewis um, thinks about that. You know, um, I, I think it's always been really important to him um, to refer to people as the human race, mm -hmm. um, even as he celebrates black people, um, black joy, music, culture, and that is very much his world. Um, he, his is a, a welcoming, um, you know, revolution. <laughs> Anyone who believes in equality and peace is welcome. Um, and, you know, when I, I poured through archives, I mean, we, we searched kind of high and low to make sure we had a, a real representation of what actually happened. And you saw quite a number of people of all races there marching and all faiths, you mm -hmm. know, um, uh, the, the Jewish community was extremely supportive of the civil rights movement. And a lot would, you know, the, uh, would not have happened without support of the rabbis as well as the other clerics and, and uh, mass leaders. And, and I think he's never forgotten that, you know, I think he knows like who uh, was there bailing him out of jail or in jail next to him. Um, and so I think, you know, he, people always say like, what, you know, what does he feel about Black Lives Matter and those protests? Um, I know that he uh, is so proud of the Black Lives Matter activists because that's the tradition that he comes out of. You know, John Lewis was the flame throwing radical of his time. So he feels an affinity with anyone who will lead an organized peaceful demonstration and assert their rights as a citizen. Um, and, you know, you really see that when he um, went uh, down, you know, he's fighting pancreatic cancer, um, but he went down to the art installation, the Black Lives Matter way, on Black Lives Matter way in Washington, D.C., and stood there, you know, proudly and powerfully, and, and I think that was to make sure everyone knew, knows how he feels, you know, that he, he takes comfort and pride in that activism. That's a beautiful mural. And that, that was a similar mural was the one that was defaced in Martinez over the weekend. We have a question from uh, Martin. Could you share his feelings the day MLK was assassinated? Did his sense of optimism wane or did he bravely move forward? Um, that is a great question, um, which I know um, quite a bit about because I had done this series, Bobby Kennedy for President, um, where he talks about that. And uh, he definitely was uh, quite depressed. He had a, a period of depression during that time. Um, and he uh, was, you know, just like, like so many times in his life, he was, you know, really in an interesting place. So he had been uh, volunteering for Bobby Kennedy's camp, uh, presidential campaign in 1968. 
-hmm. And he had organized a rally in the black community in Indianapolis on the day that Dr. King was murdered. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bobby Kennedy's white aides were saying, it's too dangerous. They will be rioting and looting and all the rest of it. You cannot go into that neighborhood and speak to those people on the day that Martin Luther King was murdered. And John Lewis said, you must go speak to people. And Bobby Kennedy did. And it's uh, known that that was one of, uh, it's largely thought to be Kennedy's best speech. Mm -hmm. It was the only time that he's ever talked about the murder of his brother, John F. Kennedy. Um, and he, as he said, at the hands of a white man. Um, and uh, Indianapolis did not burn and did not riot that day. And so I, I think it speaks to his political acumen, even in his 20s, that he knew how important it was for Kennedy to speak to people. But so King is murdered in the spring and then uh, Bobby Kennedy is murdered uh, just two months later in June. And the combina that, that combination of two of the people who uh, he revered, he really loved, he describes flying back from California. He also was with Bobby Kennedy the night of his assassination. So um, he describes flying back and just being overcome and depressed. Um, but uh, you know, he eventually kind of pulled himself together and and uh, moved on to to on the ground voting rights work. Uh, how is the congressman doing um, now? How is how is his health right now? Yeah, you know, he has uh, pancreatic cancer. It is stage four, so it is spread. Um, it's a very serious diagnosis. He is uh, at home in Atlanta. Uh, they're making him as comfortable as possible. I know that uh, he was, he's thrilled when he hears people are watching the film and sharing. They're the HBCU heroes. They are young people, you know, saying, getting good trouble. Um, all of this is actually really, it was not our intention, but I think all of this has really been helpful to him. I know that he saw, I was on Joy Reid last weekend and, you know, they, he sent me a picture with him, you know, thumbs up. So, um, you know, it's a serious diagnosis. He's taking it one day at a time. He has good days and bad days. Um, and we're just, you know, hoping for more good days. Okay. Another question from the audience. How did he reconcile his Gandhian ph philosophy with the furor of Angela Davis and Huey Newton and Malcolm X? Was he understanding of their rage and frustration? Um, I think he absolutely understood. I think he, you know, felt the frustration. Um, and, you know, there was a big split in SNCC and, um, you oh, know, really? where, that's right. So where um, Stokely Carmichael, you know, kind of, he was really pushed out and people thought um, change is not coming fast enough. And so those, he's been having those conversations from the time that he was a young activist. So um, he didn't believe in segregation of any sort. He did not believe, um, he thought saying black power would be construed as being separatist. Mm -hmm. And so he, he said, all people have power. Um, you know, and I, I think what he means by that is we're stronger together. You know, that was, that was his, uh, his way of doing things. But, you know, I, so personally, I think we need all of them, right? We need the people pushing super hard. Um, we need the people who are able to make, build bridges um, and that that's, you know, it's a combination of those people and those tactics that will, that will get us through. It's interesting. You mentioned, um, his feelings about saying black power, because right now we have, um, the presidential administration saying black lives matter, you know, or we have folks saying all lives matter, which I, I just, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't really get that. Here's something that really, um, I didn't know going into watching the, this film was that race between um, the congressman and Julian Bond. Like that is history that um, it's, it's just not been presented in, in books or articles that I've read. Um, how much were you familiar with that? And, and did you learn, um, you know, cause that was a highly contested, you know, race right there. Absolutely. Um, I did not know the details of that race at all. 
Um, and so finding that footage was, you know, I was a poli sci major in college. So I'm like really interested in those, in those kinds of things. Um, I, I thought it was really important to include that because um, it is something that few people are focused on these days, unless you were living in Atlanta at the time. But I think it also speaks to, John Lewis also has a really strong competitive streak. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, uh, if you're, if we're going to criticize him for that, which, you know, right now, like that seems quaint, you know, like he asked Julian Bond to take a drug test. I mean, it's hardly the dirty tricks, you yeah. know, that one would like, that's as dirty as John Lewis gets like, you better take a drug test. Um, uh, so, but you know, it was a bitter campaign. Um, black people are three dimensional. We have flaws mm -hmm. and virtues and John Lewis is no different. He's a human being. He made the choice that was right for him. He lived with the consequences, which was a strain on a very close friendship. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I don't know of other circumstances that he, he never had, uh, you know, a really hard contested race like that again. Mm -hmm. um, so he wasn't tested in that way. But, um, you know, I think knowing what I know of his, his service in Congress, um, I don't think he actually had that much of an appetite for you know, that kind of combative campaign. So that, that was an outlier in his, you know, in his life, but it, but it did exist. And also like that's magical footage with Bryant Gumbel <laughs> seating yeah. them side by side and just not letting it go and He's say, them. we're Both supposed to win Julian Bond and Julian is upset, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that was like, get the popcorn good, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, was, that was great. So we have another question. Um, and please, if you have any more, um, um, please send them in. Who in activism and politics do we need to be supporting now? Basically, who's the younger generation's John Lewis? Yeah, um, I don't know that we really have a, a John Lewis right now. Um, and, you know, I think that we're we're all waiting for those voices. And I, and I say that not because there aren't activist people because there certainly are. Um, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley is, is fierce, um, Val Demings. Mm -hmm. um, there's a young Congressman from New York, Antonio Delgado, who I think has a lot of promise as a, and future as a legislator. He reminds me quite, you know, of a, a young Obama. Um, so, you know, I, I do wonder, um, have we moved beyond that charismatic leader? You know, um, I'm not sure, um, but I think people are looking. I think we're ready for someone to, you know, step in mm -hmm. and uh, speak to us in a way that makes sense and, and that unites include, us. You did include some younger congressmen and women yes. in the film. Um, and that would uh, talk about just, their reaction to you saying, hey, I want to interview about John Lewis, where they... I mean, they were all, you know, in, right? Yeah. Like, it was not a, a hard ask whatsoever. Um, and, and I thought that that was telling and important. Um, they knew their history, but also the congressman, when they came into, uh, when they were elected, he reached out to all of them and you know met with them so that is something you know people say like what didn't you get to film i didn't get to film their actual meeting and we tried to set it up and we just we just couldn't get it um but you know he used to be the outsider and he has very few people have had that experience of being the outside activist and then going into the government yes and mm -hmm. and i think that they respect him quite a, a you know a good deal for that when he speaks about um, this is the way we do things in Congress. They know it's not from fear of offending anybody. <laughs> his John Lewis is, you know, his speaks his mind. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another question. And uh, can you speak about the women in his life? Uh, the doc documentary shows him surrounded by powerful women, both colleagues and family. Um, John Lewis respects women, um, you know, and yes, his senior staff. Um, his chief of staff is is a, a young man. Uh, his head of his district office is a woman. His senior constituent, uh, you know, services person is a woman. Um, he is uh, old fashioned in the best sense of the word. He is 
uh, polite and thoughtful. Um, but he, you know, his role models in going into civil rights movement were women, mm. were older black women. Yes. And, and I think that he recognizes, you know, um, the power that those women modeled. I think he always respected that and looks for that in his staff. And, and I think he, those are the people that, you know, he has kind of propped up and elevated. Okay. So Don, this is, this is, uh, I've been wanting to say this for the end. Um, you've spent a long, long time. How long did you spend making this film and editing about how much time? Uh, we spent about two years, you know, like the, the process. Um, and that, you know, for a documentary that's fast. <laughs> and I easily could have had another year. Um, I would have loved another year. Um, but um, yeah, so it's, you know, it's a couple of years, like kind of living, breathing this project. And now that it's here, it's been released, people are watching it. Uh, what do you hope viewers gain from this film? Um, you know, I feel like there's an oversimplification of our civil rights history. It's, you know, slavery ended, Dr. King happened, Barack Obama gets elected and we're good. Um, and, you know, that short changes, you know, the devil is really in the details. And the story of John Lewis and the other civil rights activists that he worked with um, is those details, is that longevity, that staying power, that one foot in front of the other form of activism that was not necessarily looking to 2090 but was looking right in front of them. What can we do today? And so I think that that lesson was very powerful for me. A lot of us, you know, people are feeling despondent, are, are doubting government, are doubting whether there are people who care. And I think the lesson of the life of John Lewis is um, that there are so many people who are quiet and determined and working for others. Mm -hmm. um, and so we all have a part in creating the community that we want to live in. So don't ask yourself, don't say I'm not brave enough to be on the bridge. I, Don Porter, I am a chicken. I am not going to, to you know, Afghanistan. I am not, I probably wouldn't be on that bridge. Um, so, you know, what Mr. Lewis would say to me is what can you do? You know, can you not participate in racist behavior? Can you not allow a relative to say something homophobic or sexist or racist? Um, so, you know, ask yourself what you can do and start there. Um, and then when the world doesn't collapse, you know, take that next step. So I think Mr. Lewis's life is about taking that next step. Don, do you have time for one more question? Yeah, sure. All right, cool. This, came, this is coming through my email. Uh, can Don talk about Mr. Lewis and actors connected with Bridge March and activism, Harry Belafonte, Blacks and Whites? Um, you know, uh, actors like, and I had the pleasure of interviewing Mr. Belafonte for my Bobby Kennedy series. Um, Harry Belafonte's work was in, incredibly uh, urgent and important. He not only marched with activists, but he uh, paid for civil rights lawyers um, he always used his voice and his music in order to bring attention. And we see that behavior modeled in John Lewis. Now mm -hmm. he is the person who was once helped by Harry Belafonte and his celebrity and wealth. And now Mr. Lewis uses his celebrity on behalf of others. So, you know, I think that he um, really is paying it forward. Um, Harry Belafonte is a, a tremendous example of a person who, um, you know, never stopped speaking up mm -hmm. and managed to, to continue his career and, you know, because of in a large manner, you know, like this, this handsome, he, uh, Harry Belafonte talked about going to Bobby Kennedy's um, home in New York. And when Bobby Kennedy said, you know, like you all should be quiet and be calmer. And he was like, that's not gonna happen. So, you know, part of what I did in the Bobby Kennedy series is show how much influence black people had in Bobby Kennedy's evolution into the civil rights advocate that he would become. And part of that was like a John Lewis, Harry Belafonte wouldn't let uh, Bobby Kennedy off the hook. 
Mm -hmm. Just like neither of them has let other people off the hook. So that's a good, that's a, we'll wrap it up there. I do want to know what have you been doing? What's your uh, pandemic hack of having to stay <laughs> home <laughs> with husband and kids, you know, and everyone's just inside. What's your, what's your hack? Um, yeah. So I have teenagers. I have an 18 year old and a 16 year old, two boys. Um, so that's fun. They love being locked with me in the house. They just love it. Um, so I, I will, you know what, I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you what I did though. Oh, awesome. We're getting an inside view of a filmmaker studio here. <laughs> yeah. This is, I'm now, I'm a knitter. <laughs> I, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, there's benefits to being with people you love and mm -hmm. sharing space and learning each other's rhythms. So we try to eat dinner together every night. Um, I go walking. We're lucky enough to back up into a, you know, wooded preserve. So nature is very important and uh, very fortunate for that. Um, but you know, it's hard. I have a lot of down days. Um, I am also extremely fortunate that the work I do, I love. Yes. And that I've been able to continue to do it in this form. So um, this is not the way that we want to, <laughs> to spread the word about this film. So every single person who is tuning in and listening and tweeting and, and sending kind thoughts. Um, I just deeply appreciate them because the ability to work and to have this connection is really what is, you know, keeping me, keeping me going. Ooh. Well, Dawn, I want to thank you for making good trouble. And I'm, I'm so glad such a remarkable person is, is able to see uh, what, his how his life impacted so many lives so i'm thank you for that i also want to uh, thank bam pfa for uh, having us on in this discussion um and i want to thank the viewers for um tuning in um logging on uh and uh i hope to see many of you before 2021 but um but just please be safe wear your masks and love people that's all i want to say thank you so much that was really fun i really appreciate you Cool. Thank you so much. I'll see you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.